my church where I am pastor is I took in a fourth generation of people whose children had been born and reared in that church. How we needed thoroughly and completely to re-examine what we stood for less than any time we let it slip. Yes, this is a holiness camp meeting. I was thinking just before Dr. Anderson prayed it, I think the Lord laid it in my heart. And I was telling God that every grain of sand in this concrete floor, every nail in these boards, and every molecule in this lumber was dedicated to the grand and glorious doctrine of Bible holiness. And no sooner had that prayer escaped my whispering lips than the doctor prayed it audibly, verbally, and strongly to God here in the platform. Immediately the Holy Ghost applied to my heart the beautiful promise from the gospel. But if any two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, it shall be done. <laughs> Immediately he called to my mind the Greek word there that is used as the word we get symphony from. If any two of you agree like chords in harmony, if the Holy Ghost lays it on this instrument and that instrument and like two tuning forks in tune, one vibrating and the other begin to vibrate, I shall bring it to pass. I believe God wants that to go out to all the country and around the world. A repeated challenge to second blessing holiness out of the Florida holiness camp meeting. I so told Dr. Anderson tonight that I believe with all my heart that on the 27th day of July, 1937, 19 years ago come this next July, at a quarter to eleven o'clock, God sanctified me as a definite, drastic, distinct, second work of grace. For nineteen years I have done my utmost with many failures and varying success. Whether I filled a large place or a small, to be about the Master's working in the light of second blessing holiness. I may meet God tomorrow. I want to live under the shadow of meeting God tonight. As the song is said, I may be in heaven tomorrow. I'd like to witness to you tonight. I want God to use me in whatever capacity I'm here to bring about a witness to old-fashioned, eradicating, Sky blue, second blessing holiness. I want to be true to the doctrine of my fathers. I want to be true to the blessed book of God. I want to be true to the work of grace the Holy Ghost wrought in my heart. That morning of that hot summer day while fleecy clouds obliterated the sun in the state of Tennessee 19 years ago. I want to be true to what a man did on the outside of an eastern city 1,900 years ago when he gave his hands to them that drave the spike and his face to them that plucked out the beard. I want to witness to you that God can save and sanctify. The text the Lord laid on my heart as I sat in my room tonight is one very familiar to the holiness movement. It's an old text. It's been preached on by great preachers and less preachers. It fell from the lips of the divine master. It came from Jesus directly. Great books have been written and entitled it. Great sermons have been given and oratory, flowery oratory has been showered about it. There are but two words in it. They are the first two words of a verse that doesn't have but one sentence in it. They are the words, sanctify them. Then it follows, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. A checkered pattern of oriental moonlight had fallen across gray-green olive leaves. As they strode from an upper room, a solitary man gathered around him were eleven solitary other men. As he walked beneath the silken fog that veiled Herman in its beauty, 
As he walked down by where the rosemary lolled in the other way. As he walked by the crowd who'd lighted their cedar fires to drive away the chill of a Palestinian night. He paused in a sequestered look, no, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son may also glorify thee. Hast thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifest thy name unto thee, unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were. Thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy way. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. But I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I come out from thee. And they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine. And I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world. But these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost. But the son of perdition that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And now come out of thee. These things I speak in the world that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word. And the world hath hated them because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they may all be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee. And these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. May God bless the reading of his word. The text again is just two words out of that long context. Sanctify them. We put it in quotation marks and write it in red on our memory. 
It is the message the church today needs to hear as that one did 19 centuries ago. Sanctify them that the church may have a holy unity, that the church may have a glorious, blazing glory, that the church may give a challenging testimony of the Messiahship and the Redeemership and the Saviorship of Jesus, that we may get home to heaven and behold him as the Father wants him to hell. There are three points to my message tonight. The first point is the condition laid down divinely for sanctifying them. The second point is the consecration necessary for sanctifying them. The third point, the consequence of sanctifying them. Them represents the church. The sanctifying is an act of God. If the church will meet God's conditions, it can and will be sanctified. If it makes the consecration that God's conditions demand, it can and will be sanctified. If it meets the conditions and its consecration that God demands and can and will be sanctified, certain invariable consequences will result to the consternation of the devil, to the delight of the angels, and the glorification of Christ, and the uplift of the church, and the spread of redemption. Thank God for holiness. Look at it. You might break down the conditions, relevant and presupposed in sanctification, under four heads. The plan of the Father, the provisions of the Son, the presence of the Spirit, and the prayers of the saints. Those conditions are always divinely imposed. They are divinely given. They must be humanly met. Or there will be no resultant holiness in the hearts of men and the hearts of women. The plan of the Father in Ephesians 1, 4. Before the foundation of the world, he hath chosen us in him that we might be holy. And he promised to the father of the Jewish race, Abraham, according to Luke 1, 75, that his people might follow him and serve him in holiness all the days of their life. And in his predestinated, sovereign, unbreakable plan that the devil can't fool with and fallen angels can't trouble with and men can't block. He has chosen us, the redeemed, unto salvation from sanctification of the Spirit, according to the Second Thessalonians 2.13. God has set up a plan. That plan operates under every clime. It operates to every man of whatever racial line he may belong. It cuts across the common creeds of men. It reaches in the hovel and into the throne room. It reaches everywhere, and that plan of God is holiness unto the Lord. The very chant of the angels in heaven is holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. The very cry of the seraphims in Ezekiel's day was holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. The very chant of the angels in Isaiah's day was holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And the song of the saints down across the ages will be, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. The other morning while preaching on the Trinity, I thought this very theological compound here, the Trisagion, would hold out to us the blessing of the Trinity. One holy for the Father, one holy for the Son, one holy for the Spirit, and the three come together in an ether of holiness and an elixir of perfect love and bring holiness down to our hearts until we are holy under God. Thank God for the plan of God that is holiness under the law. The prophet of old said in that great millennial day he would inscribe on the bridle bits of the horses holiness under the law. He said in the cooking vessels in the house, he'd inscribe holiness under the Lord. He would take his pen and write on the hearts of his people, holiness under the Lord. And holiness will dwell everywhere, and men will walk in a highway on that day from down the south way toward Jerusalem. And it shall be inscribed a way of holiness, and the unclean shall not walk 
there is. I was told when a young freshman in college that a holy God inspired holy men to write a holy book, calling you and me to holiness, that we may be participate in the holy death of a holy redeemer, and be made partakers of the Holy Ghost and partakers of a holy divine nature, that we might live a holy life, die a holy death, rise in a holy resurrection, and shout with holy angels down the streets of a holy city into an endless and holy eternity. Plan of God is under the Lord. Not a lot of this watered down pseudo holiness we get today. But old-fashioned, genuine, sin-killing, second blessing, old-fashioned holiness that God has seen. The holiness which we pay down a price to settle. The holiness that takes all the filth out of us, off of us, and from around us, and places us in a brand new highway walking beneath the luster of God's everlasting sun. The plan of God then is holiness under the Lord. And it is so strong that he said, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And it is so strong that it's either holiness or hell, holiness or hell, holiness in heaven, holiness or hell, and we'll never make it without holiness of God. The second thing about it, the provisions of the Son to give us these conditions. In Hebrews 13, 12, we are told that Jesus suffered without the gate for the people that he might sanctify them in his own blood. All the red streams of the blood that flowed from bulls and goats could not do it. All the blood and the ashes of a red heifer couldn't do it. All the blood from the wrung head of a dove couldn't do it. All the types were shadows of something that was to come until the final paschal lamb, the elect of God, laid aside the diadem of creation and walked down the golden avenue of God's holy incarnation and fondled himself in the womb of a little Jewish maiden and was virgin born and walked 33 years and hung on a cross and died for our redemption. There can be no holiness without him. No price in my hands can I bring to the mourner's face to get holy. No consecration am I big enough to buy holiness. No educational attainments can I pile up big enough to merit it. No gold can I lay down enough to buy it. No pulpit mannerisms and oratory will bring it to me. But I've broken in a contrite high, sackcloth and ashes robing my soul. Walking down a lonely way of death to where the lily drops a dewdrop of tear. Rising again with the Lord Jesus and appropriating his shed blood. On the mercy seat of glory and on my heart at the one time. We'll ever open golden gates here and golden gates hereafter. And turn me into that everlasting region of holiness of heart. Sanctified because he died on the cross. He said, Father, for this cause, I give myself in sanctification. But that crowd down there in Florida on that white sand among the palmettos. The that crowd out Chandon, Oregon, underneath the tall redwoods. The that crowd in Kentucky, up there around those big bluegrass hills. The that bunch down on the red hills neath the singing pine trees of Georgia. That crowd over on in the des- deserts of Arabia. That bunch down in darkest Africa and that bunch on India's coral strands. They all get in and get underneath the trippings of the fountain and bask in the mercy seat shedded light of God and get sanctified of body damage. Simon Peter chimed in and said, You're not redeemed with corruptible trash like silver and gold but with a precious blood, the Lamb of God. The writer said in Leviticus, the life of the flesh is in the blood thereof. And the blood is the most precious thing a man's got, and he'll give everything he's got for his blood. And the most precious blood on earth, uncontaminated by Adam's fall, 
is the virgin blood that poured through the veins and arteries of the divine Son of God, Jesus Christ. Pile all the diamonds up from the heart of Africa and sweep the oceans and, un- and clean out every oyster and pile the pearls on top of it. Dig out all the platinum and put it through its chemical processes to bring it out as precious metal. Pile your rubies up over yonder a mountain high and your amethyst and your emeralds yonder. Rub all the wealth of the earth and blow it away into oblivion and you still can't buy one soul. But hand Mary's son, that man that came from Basra with his garments died. Hand that eternal priest after the order of Melchizedek yonder. Take that pastor lamb and lay your hands on him and turn him into a scapegoat and a lamb at the same time. And lay on him the iniquity of his heart. And let his own red blood trickle down to his heels yeah. and hang him on Calvary's cross. And by his own precious blood, he'll redeem us for that. Hey, glory to God. Oh, Lord. Oh, I like that. God imposed the condition. God held a mortgage and never the devil held it tall. Away with this cheap doctrine of the atonement that tells us the devil held our souls and demanded payment and took the blood and walked off with it. Never put his dirty ninja hands on the mortgage at all. When the glorious kinsman redeemer walked down, he said, Father, you've got the mortgage. That bankrupt crowd don't have a thing to pay down there. Will you take my blood in lieu of that debt and cancel the mortgage? And the father said, I'll do it. And he gave his blood and he might pay on the mortgage and said, Come on, all ye that thirst and buy wine and milk without money and without price. Glory be to God. Provisions of the Son. Third thing, it takes the presence of the Holy Ghost to do it. The 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th chapters of John are about the Holy Ghost and His coming. I've come down here and have done the teaching, said Jesus. I've kept them around me and not a one of them's gotten out of my hands in a loss. I've got my fingers around them and the devil and nobody else, if they want to stay in it, can unpluck my fingers. I brought them to this hour all but the son of perdition. They are here with me and I'm holding on to them. I've got to leave them down here to come back there to fill another ministry at the mediatorial throne. I've got to get up there and fail their prayers in as a priest mediating between their God and these men. I've got to give them a paracrutos. I've got to give them somebody that's called alongside to bolster them up. I've got to give them a comforter that'll stand by them when they're dying. That'll stand by them when the ships are rocking. That'll stand by them when the fires are kindling. That'll stand by them when the lions are roaring. That'll stand by them when everything's are going wrong. I've got to give them something that'll stand by them when the swords are bathed in their own red blood. I've got to give them something. Got to give them a presence filled with a capsule key. Got to give them a third personality. I've got to put in them something that'll make them sufficient for the day. I've given them the authority and I've got to give them the dynamics. I've given them the exousia and I've got to give them the dionymus. I've laid on them the call and I've got to give them the equipage for battle. I've sounded the trumpet and I've got to draw the saber and lay it in their hands. I've given them the way, now I've got to push them into it. I've laid out the blueprint, now I've got to toss them out there on the waters and say, charge your course and box your compass and swing Zion round and bring her in. I've written the orders, I've got to put them in operation. They've got to have a presence. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all of one accord in one place. Suddenly there came from heaven a sound as of a right mighty rushing wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. 
Glory be to God, the presence had walked in. Walked him to abide forever. For Jesus said when he's come, he'll abide with you forever. Amen. He's no guest. He's no visitor. He's a rightful tenant coming in, carrying in his hand a little sack of heaven's dirt, saying, children, here's the earnest of it, and I'm bringing it in now. One day you can claim the last one. Amen. But they have a presence to meet these conditions. I do too. Amen. I liked it 19 years ago, and I like it tonight. Amen. I like it up yonder where the muddy Ohio runs down between a green phrase to meet the embrace of the big Mississippi. I love it on Kentucky's green hills. I love it in Florida. I was preaching up in New England, Pennsylvania the other day, and I loved it up there. I aim to love it when I lay my life down. I aim to love it on the resurrection morning when they take my little resurrection robe off of the jewel hook up in glory and I drop the cerema to the tomb and float up to me. God, I aim to love it too. Thank you, Jesus. Now tied into all these three that are plan of the Father, provision of the Son, the presence of the Spirit, the prayers of the saints coming. You've never gotten sanctified till you ask to get sanctified. A lot of cheap holiness. If there is any such thing I want it, just well to kiss it goodbye, you'll never get it. If there is such a blessing, I want to know it. You know it already. You wouldn't be praying that way. No more dodges. No more bedtime prayers. Getting down and laying hands on the horns of the altar. Joining the battle. Drawing the sword and throwing everything else away. Major Thomas Jackson, later the famous Lieutenant General Stonewall Jackson, was teaching in Virginia Military Institute at Lexington. The days just before secession, hot blood was running everywhere and men were stirred up. And the cadets at the Institute went on a strike and said, we won't go to our classes. They're mistreating Virginia and we're just going to walk out. Commandant said, Major, go down and see if you can get that cadet corps back in the classroom. Jackson walked down and said, gentlemen, line up. And he dressed the line down, and they lined up and presented arms. He said, Virginia's still in the Union. We are still under the stars and stripes. We are citizens, and you are soldiers of the Union. Now get back to your studies. But young gentlemen, if Virginia ever leaves the Union, I want you, everyone, to draw your sabers and throw the scabbards away. There better be a little of that done in the holiness movement. Better draw sabers and throw the scabbards away. And tighten down to this kind of a prayer meeting that gets us through regardless of whether our hair is gray or black, red or yellow, till we get the blessing and stay with God. Amen. Prayers of the saints. Agonizing prayer. <clears throat> Secondly, the consecration that meets the conditions to sanctifying thee. Dr. Daniel Steele said consecration is to holiness what repentance is to regeneration. That's the truth. Men never get saved till they repent. They never get sanctified till they make a complete, unreserved, and whole consecration. Dig a shallow foundation, your walls will crack. Dig down to the bedrock and they'll stand. Go deep and you can go high. Go shallow and you'll stay low. Pay the price and you'll get the blessing. Fiddle around the corners and you'll take a little pseudo wholeness and die and go to hell. Lose yourself. Nobody's got a corner on it. Pilgrims, Nazarenes, Methodists, Baptists, Camelites, and nobody else. Pay the price Amen. and you'll get the blessing. This consecration is, is a foreheaded thing. It's conditional. It's got to be carefully done. It's got to be complete. And it's got to be continued. You've got to meet those four conditions to get your consecration made. First, I said it's conditional. It's conditioned on three things. You wish, you will, you work. If you want to get sanctified bad enough, make up your mind and set your will. You're going to have it. If you're hungry enough for it and make up your will, you're going to get it, then go to work to bring your will and your wish to bear. 
and you'll get the fruit of hope. I heard a professor at Emory University say one morning, now I was visiting in a class in the theological seminary there, that the way men got to God, they wished they were there, they willed to get there, they went to work to get there. I kind of like it. I say to you this night, if you want to get sanctified, are you hungry enough to get it? Are you hungry enough to cross a barbed wire fence, swim through water, go through fire, hungry enough to die out? If you're not, don't even start. You get a fellow that loses appetite, you've got a sick man on your hands. You get a fellow that quits eating, he's going to initiate and die. You get a fellow that's not hungry for God and hungry for holiness, he'll be running off to prize fights and picture shows and roller skates and dance halls and every other devilment on earth and professing religion at the same time. If you get hungry enough for it, you'll die out. And if you don't get hungry enough, you're not going to die out. And if you get hungry enough, you're going to set your will to get it. You get ox hungry enough. He'll fight you till the world looks level to get to a pile of straw. And you get hungry enough, you're going to fight devils, men, and everybody else to get the blessing. Amen. No matter what your theological prejudice is, no matter what your church thinks, and eight Kate thinks, and Uncle Joe thinks, and Dr. Tony thinks, and Lauren Six thinks, you're going to get sanctified if you get your mind made up. Settle the thing. Then after you've done it, you can't sit back there and wish and sit back there and will and, and play like you've got it. It don't work that way. Don't have to get out in the aisle and walk that long walk that's made out of Indian rubber and it stretches the further you walk. And fall about the last ten feet and drape across a mourner's bank like an owl over a tombstone on a wet night at midnight. Then I huddle the last nails driven and the epitaphs cut on the tomb of the old man. <laughs> Condition. God's not going to swing it down on a golden cord, wrap it up in a bejeweled case, and drop it into your heart grass. He's made every provision in the red blood of Jesus Christ to give it to you. He's put enough sense in your head to get it. He's put enough hunger in your heart to pull you. And now just put your sense and your hunger together and plunge in. Hunt the deepest place and see how high you can splash the water. Get in, a head and ears, toenails and all. Get in. Amen. Get in and get sanctified. <clears throat> Pay no attention to the holiness fighters or the thickly set along the way like croaking ravens on the leaf. <laughs> Leave them in the lurch behind. Stay away from the crowd that's always telling you that you've got to conquer this area and that area and psychologize this and grow a little young and philosophize that. Pile the whole thing up with one big brush and get to a mourner's bench and die out like a yellow tomcat on the church door and you'll get the blessing. I know that's not dignified. I've been to school a little bit. I can at least read and sometimes write my name the way I can read it, whether everybody else can or not. Walked across one or two campuses in my day. Cracked open a few books. But thank God I had enough sense to see holiness in the Bible where it was. And a lot of folks can't see it where it is or isn't. <laughs> the first condition is then wish it, will it, work at it till you're sanctified. Second thing is it's got to be done carefully. Luke chapter 14, verse 25 through 30 said, If you're going to build a tower, sit down. Take your pencil. Figure it out. See whether you got enough money to finish it. Lest after happily you start, you don't have enough money, you quit, and everybody makes fun of what you've done. There's been so many Nazarenes, Pilgrims, Methodists, Presbyterians, Baptists, and Quakers started to build a tower and got a pretty good hole dug and left the hole there. And everybody come around and laughed at the rigors, hails of rainwater made in the hole. A lot of them got it up above that and then let the weeds take it. And the folks came by and chewed their back and spit at the weeds and made fun of the mess. A lot of them got up to the window line and stood there like ghastly ghosts in the night with blank staring eyes. But now and then a fellow got up and got the beams on and the, and the, and the eaves finished and got his towel built and the crowd shouted at him. 
Settle it that you're going to get sanctified. Going to have to be carefully done. Here you know, comes a king with 10,000. I've got five here. Yeah, I better find out whether I can thrash his 10 with my five. I better make peace before I get into warfare then. Jesus said, if you can't do it that way, you're going to have to have the heart emptied before the Holy Ghost will come in. Wellness and selfishness and pride and all those things, uh, the traits of carnality are going to have to come out. And when they're out and gone, God will invariably fill, for God-like nature hates a vacuum. And where there is no carnality, there's spirituality. For they that walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, are alive and live for the Lord. Now, I tell you, the consecration is conditional, must be carefully done and complete. Then it must be continual. You can't leave it there and say, now I'm going to let it stay there, but you're going to have to keep it there. Devil will slip around and try to slip this off the altar and talk you out of that. Devil will try to come around and make everybody make fun of you and take something else off the altar. Anything that's on the altar must be tied with cords there and let eternity's sun break across the eastern hills on that consecration. It's got to be eternally done. A lot of folks start out well and they did run well for a while and what hindered them? I'd like to make it in. I'd like to catch the second wind. I'd like to sprint in the last mile and I'd like to make it to glory. And the consecration is a continual thing, not a rededication and a reconsecration, but the one I made back there has got to be kept where I made it and anything else the Lord brings up, that too caps the stack and I've got Amen. to go with God. Amen. Pastor, a nice church. I have the best layman on earth. I'm afraid they're going to backslide me someday being so good to me. Some of them are back there tonight. I love my people. I'm satisfied with my church. God has given me a lovely church and the lines have fallen out in pleasant places. But I've gotten on my knees more times than once recently and told God I was ready to step back in a home missionary charge. And I walked the floor of the parsonage the other night nearly midnight and almost asked God, wouldn't he let me have a little church? I tell you, beloved, I want to keep that kind of consecration I had on there when I was a young boy preaching in ragged clothes in the hills of Tennessee. And if I don't do it, I'll lose my soul. Yes, yes. Dr. Anderson said to me tonight, wouldn't it be awful? God would have the very hottest hell for us if we knew this thing like we do and don't make it and let it and preach it tell folk about it. Be continued. Third, the consequences of being sanctified. Bro, there ought to be some consequences to this thing. There are certain conditions. If I meet them, I make the consecration in meeting them. It ought to have some consequences to it. There ought to be some sequences. There ought to be a sequel around here. I've built a fire and struck the match. There ought to be some fire flying around here. I've turned on the electricity. There ought to be some light in this house. I've paid the price. There ought to be something bought. I've gotten the consecration down. There ought to be some fire on the altar. Can I look for consequences? Yes, I can. Blessed be God. There are four things in this long chapter, the 17th chapter of John I read, that this kind of consecration will bring. They're in the 20th, 21st, 23rd, and 24th verses. Number one, that they may be one. Sanctification will weld us together in a holy oneness till we'll present a united front against the devil. Thank God for that. If we ever needed anything against the liquor trap, if we ever needed anything against the lewd, loose sexuality of today, if we ever needed anything against the, the lowering of morals as we have them today, we need the church of God to present a solid phalanx and move out to challenge the world that we've got the goods on board. We need to stroke our guns down well. We need to pile God's cannons full. We need to tamp the ramrod down till they are loaded to the muzzle of canister and grape. Turn the whole outfit to loosen the ranks of the devil and watch the consternation there unto a Amen. We need that kind of religion. We've got to have a oneness. Right here on this platform, I have stood. 
Nazarenes and Methodist preachers and priests in this fair camp, and you couldn't tell one from another. Two years ago, John Church and Tony Anderson and Lawrence Hicks stood here. You couldn't tell who's what church. Now, all of them preached second blessing holiness, and you got stirred up and got blessed and got to shouting, and they had to have somebody to identify you. Couldn't have told who you were. We need to present a common front. Everywhere sin rears its head, we need somebody to come down on it with a club with both hands. Amen. Everywhere there's anything wrong, we need the church to take a stand. Everywhere God needs a champion and an intercessor, we need to be that champion and that intercessor. We've got to have our oneness about this thing. To just the name of Christ is our name. Just the way of holiness is our way. Then there's something about the glory in verse 21. I want them sanctified so they can get in the glory. I heard Dr. Benner, one of our general superintendents in my church, say the other night, we talk about when the veil was rent in the temple, it turned us into the mercy seat. He said, there's something else it did. It turned the glory out to us. And I like that. The glory doesn't have to stay back there between golden angels above the mercy seat any longer, but the veil's lifted. And the glory can come into our souls so we can say with Dr. Jessup, I met a man with a shining face. Amen. Glory be to God. That's more glorious than being sanctified. Ask the worst sinner on earth, and he'll say, if I ever get religion, I want the kind save God. And men may fight your holiness, but they'll demand the second blessing holiness standard of you before they'll have one ounce of confidence in your regeneration. You skin somebody in the trade, and they'll pitch you overboard. You lie and tell dirty jokes, and they'll pitch you overboard. You hang around the prize fights and watch them, whether they be by television or in their, in their arena. They'll pitch you overboard. You hang around the picture shows and the, and the dance halls, they'll pitch your religion overboard. They don't want a little watered-down cheap thing. They want somebody that's contacted another world and got his head in the sky. They want somebody that's got the goods so they'll have no confidence in religion. They don't want the dram drinker around them professing religion. They want the fellow that abstains. They don't want the whoremonger professing religion. They want a clean man. They don't want the liar. They want a truthful man. They don't want the fellow that skinned them in a deal the day before. They want the honest man. They want the fellow that's got the glory. And the glory don't mean the crowd that makes the biggest noise. Amen. I've seen folk run the aisles and scream and hoop and almost climb the poles backwards and get out and live just as low as the grasshoppers. We've got to have something besides a racket. We've got to have something besides a fuss. We've got to have something besides a sham. We've got to have something beside a blank cottage. We've got to have something with a kick in it. Got to have somebody up there that says, Hello, when you ring the telephone down here. Got to have something on board. Have something when the drums go rolling, dial like and defiant. It'll make you straighten up and fall in. Got to have something. The glory. I don't know what the glory is. I know it feels good when it tingles my whole body, Amen. like a galvanic shock or something. <laughs> I don't know what the glory is. I guess it got in Samson's palms that day and made him itch to choke lines. <laughs> I don't know what the glory is. I guess it got in his big old shoulders and mighty prize up the gates of gaze and marched off with him. I don't know what the glory is, but it got in a dry shepherd's rod and opened up the Red Sea. I don't know what the glory is, but it's gotten a sling of a David and brought down a Goliath without a Tazuza. I don't know what the glory is, but it's gotten the stammering tongue of a Buddy Robinson and swept him around the world and swept thousands into the kingdom. 
Now I don't know what the glory is, but I've seen it on Henry Clay Marsh with his white hat and long tail coat to a men almost died in that few. I don't know what the glory is, but I've seen it on many a good old Methodist and Nazarene, the pilgrim woman, when they walk down the aisle with a handkerchief in the hand and a tuck and comb fall out now and then and got blessed and shouted and had a good time and died with a hand up in the air on the deathbed saying, no, old granny's got it and going home to be a Jesus. <laughs> I've never seen the blazing fire. I've never seen the Shekinah spread round. But I've seen the devastating effects of it. Oh, I tell you, we've got to have the glory. Then he said in the third place, sanctify them that the world may know. The Greek word there for world is not key, but it's cosmos. Literally, it means a cosmos of a universe. I want you to sanctify them to those fallen angels out trying to know that the thing works. Amen. I want you to sanctify them for all that unholy gang out trying to know it works. I want you to sanctify them to the carnal church will know it'll work. Yeah. I want you to sanctify them so they'll be satisfied it's a working in them. I want the universe, the whole cosmos to know that the thing works. Yeah. Got to have something on board that'll convince. Oh, I tell you, talk about preaching without the blessing, I don't know what to do to do that. I get in the brush enough to see it. I might not get in the tall timbers if I didn't have the blessing. All kind of booger bears and growling lions and devils anywhere where I preach most of the time. I don't know what it appear if I didn't have the blessing. God don't how to keep enough glory on me and my eyes blinded to enough of folks out there that I can preach holiness. So I want to convince the cosmos that it works. But my blood didn't flash on those old gray rocks for nothing over yonder. I didn't walk down from the golden throne and die and live like a common man and put calluses on my hand with a maul and a chisel and a carpenter's plane for nothing. I want them to know that I didn't wet my beard many a night with a dew out churn in the olive orchard for nothing. I want them to know that I didn't shed my blood for nothing.